Well, the reason, as most of us here, is to use the speaks we, we acquire in, in our everyday business life. And for me personally, it's very important also to apply them with my wife and two kids. Too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so back to you now. Okay, so uh, we're Full tour of uh, yeah, yeah, we're gonna do a full tour. <laughs> so I can understand how I'm gonna be speaking yeah. about because it depends on what you're interested in. Otherwise, I'm just <coughs> saying something standardized and I wanna yeah, help. Yeah, I'm sure people have yeah. a very good reasons for being here. Because out of curiosity, yeah. I was invited uh, by a friend of mine, so just curious about uh, the topic and about yourself. <laughs> yeah, anyway, I certainly need to improve also my oral skills and my Why did you improve that? Uh, why not? Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you benefit? Because you were not in my last my last interview. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, the same here. Actually, I was kindly invited by a friend, and I am not, I'm not a member of this club yet. <laughs> <laughs> forward, maybe one one day I will become. Yeah. Perfect. So. Thomas, um, basically I joined the Toastmasters rather recently and when it comes to speaking skills I will need them for meetings and interview situations. Perfect. Uh, hi, I'm Adrian. Also similar um, to these colleagues, also not a member, just part of an invitation, not really um, knowing what it's about, but when I learn something more about Toastmasters, that's one thing. Perfect. Shuma is my name. I'm a Toastmaster member since three, four years. And how Toastmasters fits into your day to day and uh, in your life? Uh, Toastmasters, uh, it helped me a lot already. I have now, I must say, good uh, listening skill and evaluating, but I still have to improve a lot to present mm -hmm. myself. Perfect, thank you. I'm just a visitor. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm 
want to be a better communicator for my professional work, but also for my personal life? How does it fit in uh, being a better communicator in your per personal and professional life? Can you give uh, an example? Being more convincing, people listening, making an impact, <coughs> bringing on people with arguments. Negotiations or...? Yeah. Oh, okay, perfect. Did you feel the back? <laughs> What is the reason why you joined Toastmasters? Or you guys are visitors? I was joining it just here and just by for today. Good. So you remember that? Yes. Yeah. Because, uh, yes, I wanted to improve uh, my language skills. Mm -hmm. And I, I came several times and I, I saw that it was the right place to be because people were quite enthusiastic and willing to help you with a good feel and uh, yeah, I decided to Toastmasters is also about leadership, right? Toastmasters develop our leadership skills and it's important in your job to be a good leader. And I'm just going to start with a little exercise we get moving and so you can understand a little bit the concept of leadership in your body. So everybody let's stand up very quick. Let's stand up. Have you guys heard about Simon Says in a little game? So I'm gonna say like raise one hand, raise one hand, raise one hand, and touch your nose, touch your nose. We're like, I'm not gonna say left hand, right hand, this is not confusing. But it's gonna be very simple. So let's start. Raise one arm, raise the other arm, raise one leg, touch your nose, raise the other leg. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Did you see what happened? Yeah. We sit down now. That is the aspect of leadership that most of us forget. We then just say like, oh, I'm going to tell people to do this, this, this. How can I improve my motivational skills? How can I improve, make people do this? But we forget that people don't do what we tell them. They look at us and see what we're doing. So when we're saying like, oh, you've got to work harder, and we're not working hard. That's a conflict. And everyone we tell that, they're going to behave as we do, not as we say it will be perfect if people do actually what we say. That's not the case. And what I'm going to say now here, all the topics are going to be very participative. It's going to be very uh, interactive. So you feel like you get these concepts in your body. You can evaluate. Because one thing that you see is that most big time entrepreneurs and 95% of uh, Fortune 500 CEOs, they have one thing in common. They all practice sports. CEOs, or mo most CEOs actually, they used to be professional athletes, but they got normally an injury or something that got them out. That's why you see all of them in black and white pictures. I could not find any recent pictures that they're playing because they, they normally go to the business world because they're professional athletes in, in college and they have some kind of, of uh, issue with one part of the body to get hurt and they can't work that anymore and they apply the same strategies into the, the work and that's what makes them successful. We're going to point out a few things and we're going to discuss, we're going to test it out and the first aspect we're going to talk about is playing 100% like are you playing 100% now at your work at Toastmasters? Like when you see an athlete after an interview, an interview after a game, you don't see them like, I did a good job today, I feel proud. You see them, yeah, I played a lot, well, I did my all. You see them physically exhausted. I'm not saying you should be physically exhausted in your work at Toastmasters, but you should give 100%. And I'm going to show you the difference. Raise their arm as high as you can right now. Let's see how everyone can do it. Okay, now what if I tell you, raise your arm 50 centimeters higher, how can, who can raise 50 centimeters higher than you did before? <laughs> <laughs> See the difference? Yeah. See the difference? Like, I, I say right now, raise your hand as high as you can. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> stood up. Where else in your life are you not standing up and putting as high as you can, as much as you can? Because now we had a second time and you, you, you stood up a few of you. Sometimes when I do this, people climb on the chairs and touch the ceiling. Because 
the thing is, how you do behave, like here right now, or in Toastmaster TV, is how you behave at work, how you behave at home. There's no difference. Like, for instance, we are here right now for about an hour, an hour and a half today. You can decide, am I going to play 100%, I'm going to participate, I'm going to do my all, or I'm just going to listen passively. When you're in Toastmaster coming to the meeting, are, are you participating, are you speaking as often as you can? Are, are you taking on the roles as much as you can? Or are you just sitting down, watching, and taking one, for instance, speaking up the, the role of the timer? But without looking at the manual and seeing what can I learn from the role of the timer? What can I learn from the role of the evaluator? I've been to five clubs in Prague when I was in Prague because there was all the clubs that had to speak in English. Because I wanted to improve. I'm a professional speaker, so I wanted to improve fast. And one thing is interesting that you see in the clubs. I was going, and I, if I wanted, I could speak every two weeks in a club. Every two weeks. We have 30 members, three spots per, uh, per meeting. That means every six spots, one was mine. In whatever club I wanted. So that allowed me to go to the project a lot faster. Like, I was looking last week in here, and I think well, the meeting was on 28th, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think I looked at the 25th, and there was still speaker slots available. Now my question is, that were there three people in the meeting? Were there? Three people in the meeting. More, three, three or more people in the meeting. Yes. So why there was a spot available? Think about yourself. Why didn't they take that spot? Why did I come here? I would spend one hour, an hour and a half in here, but I did not step up. Where else am I doing that? Where else am I going and I'm working half the time and the other half I'm on social media? Where else am I attending something and I'm not getting the most out of it? Because you only have 24 hours in a day. Everyone. The thing is, are you using those 24 hours? Or are you killing time? Are you making the most out of your experience in anywhere? Because a lot of people, you see, they come to Toastmasters and they spend a year and they haven't completed the first manual. And that's one thing that makes a lot of people quit. Because they come and one year later they, they look at themselves and they haven't improved much. And they think, like, there's something wrong. And they see other people improving, so there's something wrong with me. So I'm not going anymore. But the reason is not there's something wrong with the person. The reason is the person is taking too slow. They're, they're not making the most out of their time. They're just wasting <laughs> their time, actually. It's good to come here and, and, and do the table topics. That's awesome. You improve your, your thinking on sports, your positional skills. But the time that you have for the prepared speeches is one of the prime time of Toastmasters. It's one of the, <coughs> of the things that can develop you the most. Think, think now right now, why am I not taking the spots? Why am I waiting? And some of the things might be, oh, because I'm not prepared. Look, we're going to talk about that later, but you don't need to make it the best speech at the first time you do a project. You have the opportunity to do the project in. Are you, are you letting your fear, your ego get out of the way? Because I don't think what you fear that stop people from, from competing, uh, from coming here and doing a prepared speech. It's more about ego, it's trying to do it right the first time. It's not like, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to see how I'm going, and then I'm going to improve. Mm -mm. Most people are like, I want to do only if I can do it right. And that's not playing 100%. And you don't have a second time most of the times out there, but here you have. You can do second time, third time. Like my, um, when I was doing the, what's the manual? Was the humor speech manual. I got stuck in project number three. I did project number three, I think, five or, five or six times. Because the project said, you know what? Um, uh, you have to make three jokes during the, uh, the presentation. One in the beginning, one in the middle, one in the end. I could 
That was actually the first time you guys did not fought each other. Because the objective was to put all the chairs in one place. And normally what happens is people are stealing from others. Like, you're, you're, you're way ahead of most people when you do this presentation. Because you, you kept like, your integrity. You're like, I'm not going to hurt the other team members. I'm not, because what happens is people think, oh, we're divided in two, so we're competing against. So but I never said. We are at the UN here. Yeah. <laughs> Good. But let me point out one thing. None of you put a button would be this. Here. Everybody would win with this simple movement. You create an obstacle in your mind. You say like, oh, the, I, all the chairs are going to be here and here on the place when I point out close to here and close to the chair. And that's very, very important because I'm going to give an example for a client of mine. Uh, I had a client work in a big software firm and he was marketing director. And he got into this company and out of nowhere, like they work in a freemium model, which means they, they get new users for free and then they upsell. So he brought in like 10 times more customer than the previous marketing director per month. And what happened when he did that, the sales director got very, very greedy. He saw like mm, 10 times more free users, so I can up upsell my sales as well. I can get more sales as well. And mathematically speaking, he would get 10 times more sales anyway if he would do nothing. And he would improve his metrics. But what he did was he started pushing the sales a lot more. And what happened when he was pushing the sales more is the users were leaving, like uninstalling the software, which brought my client's metrics down. So everyone lost because of that, because my client got so fed up with that. He said, like, you know what? I can get another job in uh, another place. I'm just going to quit. And he did. And two weeks later, he was in another company. But like, the company lost a great employee because of competition without a reason. Because competition can help if you're, if you're in a friendly environment, the competition is to build up. But when the competition starts dragging for each other, that is the problem. And it all because they don't see how they can move the chair. How they can move and put in a way that everyone can win. Because even though you played 100%, you moved, you put all the chairs, you were fast. I heard some people say, wow, that was really fast, uh, how we put the chairs in, in place. But at the same time, nobody won because there were half the chairs here and half the chairs here. Nobody won. And the way to win was simply moving. But we get trapped in our mind, like, well, how can I, I win instead of how can the organization win? So think about it. Get into competitions. If all the members build up, but build up in a way that everyone can get something out of it, that you're not hurting anybody. But use competition, because competition is great for energy, you just saw. You see a lot of companies do competition. Like, like think about this example here, PlayStation and Xbox. There was another big company in between, part of this competition. Nintendo. They decided to quit. They decided, you know what, I'm going to focus on a totally different market, I'm going to create something totally different. And they, like, I don't want to make realistic games, we're going to make children games, etc. And their stock price, they dropped a lot. Now they had Pokemon Go, which got an up, but it's already down again. Because they got out of the competition. They said, I don't want to fight. Competition helps improve. You see, all the big brands has competition. Even the ones you think it doesn't have. Like, think about Amazon. They started with books. And they were competing against Barnes and & Nobles. And another book, uh, bookstore, they, they were on the top of that already. So they decided like, you know what, I'm going to compete against eBay. And then they built the whole portfolio which increased the company value and it's a monster as it is today. And now this part is a part that we get when we, we go see a sport. And I don't know what happened to you, but I see that a lot and even I do sometimes as well. We look at a player or a fighter in the competition and say, I can't believe he did that. He's so stupid. I would do this different. I would do this different. It would be a lot more effective. That happens because we are outside. We can see 
And we can point out, and it's obvious, when I'm in the heat of the game, how can you control your performance anxiety? When there is 10,000 eyes on you, and the stakes are at you because it's a final, how can you perform? How can you perform when you're in a presentation that is very, very uh, important for your business right now? Think about it. When I'm doing a presentation to, to the top guy, and the decision is going to change everything, how can I make sure that I can present as good as I'm presenting here in Toastmasters? Because that something happens. Uh, who, who would like to participate in a demonstration here right now? You? Come here. <laughs> Let's give him a hand. <laughs> Get the glass in. The glass in the wall. With your back straight, fill up this glass. With your back straight. Grab the bottle and fill up the glass. Grab. No, no, bottle. <laughs> the glass stays where it is. You just move the bottle and you fill up the glass. Good, thank you. I was really thirsty. <laughs> now what are you going to do? With the back straight, same as before, you don't move the glass, you just fill up, no, back straight, come. Same thing as before. Same thing. Yeah. My legs? Yeah, straight as well. All straight. Just like we did here. That's it, that's okay. Give me a hand. What did you do the second time? Hesitation. Hesitation. Shaking hands. Changing. Like, how can I do it? And that happens because he's, he was thinking to himself, I can't make a mistake. I gotta be perfect. Can I drop water around? And all these thoughts come to his mind, and then he starts shaking. And then the likelihood of the, the waterfall out of the glass is a lot more. The thing is, if you would have done his whole life like this, filling up bottles like this, because I don't know, he lives in a pool and he likes to do that. <laughs> I don't know. He, he would be a lot more comfortable doing that. He's like, I can just do it. Just like here. He said, I can just do it. I don't need to touch the glass to fill it up. Because at this distance, I master it. And that's the same thing with a presentation. When you're doing a presentation, it's like, have I practiced enough to know what am I going to do? Have I had this embedded in my body? To not only the practice necessarily with this bottle and this glass or that presentation, but like have a practice enough with a bottle and, and a glass, with a presentation or with presentations overall. So I don't need anymore to be so afraid of that. To be, for instance, like last week on Friday, I gave a presentation and my, my objective right in the beginning, like five minutes in, was to get the whole audience doing the wave. And it was like 300 people. Notice how much weaker you got every time you told a lie, like you told a fake name, or when you said you're weak, how you lost the strength. And that happens because when you're telling something that is true, or something that is empowering, our brain fires up only a few neurons, uh, and that's concrete, that, that we can say that out. So when we need uh, electrical signals to come down the spinal cord to the muscles, the brain has enough electricity to contract as much as we need. When we tell a lie or when we are putting ourselves down, what happened is we had to fire a lot, a lot of parts in our brain to make that a reality. So our brain doesn't have enough, uh, enough electricity to go down the spine and to the muscle. That's called muscle attesting. You can do that with a finger, you can do that in a lot of different ways. That is to prove one point that you can come here and give speeches every week. 
can do all the things that we talked about, get a mentor, everything. But if you're always putting yourself down, you're always going to be afraid of, uh, of coming in. You're always going to be afraid of taking the opportunity. You're never going to perform as good as you can if you're always afraid. Because we think about all the judgment from others, like what others are going to think about me. But that's BS. That's rationalization. What we are really afraid when we think about that is how am I going to treat myself like Because if we give a presentation here and everybody likes, and everybody gives you feedback, and, and everybody think you're a good speaker, but if you're thinking, I did a crap job, I did 12 months, or I did not say this thing that I wanted to say, and you start putting like, I'm such a loser because of that, I can't do anything right. But what happens is, you're going to lose a lot of motivation to come here next time. Because, look, in the world out there, a lot of people are going to put you down. Even your friends and family might put you down. But you can't be your worst enemy. You can't tell yourself always, like, I'm such a loser, can't do anything right, why do I even try? When you hear that, that little voice of you telling like, things like that, you got to say, stop! You know what? I can do it. I'm doing my best. It might not be the best, but I'm doing my best. And when I do my best, I'm going to improve. When I do my best, I'm going to achieve my goal. It doesn't matter if it's not on the time that I planned. It doesn't matter that tomorrow I won't be able to give a three-day seminar for 10,000 people and have everyone engaged from the first moment all the way to the last. But you got to think, I can do the best I can right now. And if I practice and if I do it, I will be able to. I might not be able to convince my boss to do this thing right now. But in the next presentation, I might be able, or in the next. And I'm going to keep on trying until I succeed. And when you do that, you're going to see how much more easy it's going to be for you to come here and give a presentation if you allow yourself to make the mistakes. Just like with the water bottle. When you allow yourself to make the mistakes, you're less likely to make the mistakes. Just because your brain has more electrical power. So you can fire up more, so you can have better problem solving, you can get more creativity, you can think better on the spot. That's why tabletop is so easy. Because when, you, when you're when you in tabletop, since you get the, the thing on, on, the, on the spot, you allow yourself to make the mistake. And that's a lot more pleasurable than giving the prepared speech, because, but not because the prepared speech is longer, what most people think. It is because on the prepared speech, a lot of people don't give themselves the opportunity to make mistakes. So, I want to end up with, with this. Give yourself the opportunity to make mistakes. Play full out, but give yourself the opportunity to not be uh, perfect. Raise your, your standards, raise the bar. Do the best that you can, always. But don't think that you need to be the best right now. Aim for being the best, but give your best right now. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo. You never make people laugh in the middle of the presentation. And the thing is, I could have done like most people. Like, oh, I did the speech, I passed, I'm going to go to project four. And I would go through the manual a lot faster in that way. But, and that's a big but, I wouldn't learn. I wouldn't really be 100%. And I'm not saying like you should uh, be harsh on yourself and say, oh no, that wasn't perfect, so I'm, I have to stay here. But until you're satisfied, because you're going to get feedback from others. And as you said, the feedbacks are going to be always empowering feedbacks. And that is great for the motivation. But you've got to give yourself feedback and say, did I complete as well as I could, as well as I should? And that's actually not going to slow you down. Because if you do that, and at the same time you're taking on more projects, you're doing fair speech more often, you go up a lot faster. Anyway, let's see. We have two meetings a month, right? Yes, two meetings a month. So in the last two months, how, how many of you actually gave a speech in the last two months? 
One, two, three. Three people in the last few months. And so we have four meetings, which is equal to 12 opportunities. Three people took on those opportunities. Why? Because we are too busy. Yeah. So why didn't you take the most important role in those classes? Perfectionism. Everyone is waiting for it. Yeah. And then it takes too long. And then I'm saying that, and I might sound like I'm coming here just to pound on you and, and point out the bad things, but I'm saying that to prepare you so you don't get frustrated later on and think I'm attending many, many, many meetings and I don't see the results. The results are there for you. You just got to play it 100%. Like, Think about an athlete. They, they don't do their best only in the finals, only when the things are at stake. <laughs> they, they, they play their all, they give their all on the qualifying series, on the semifinals, on the finals. Everywhere they, they give their best, they give their all. Because that's how they're going to improve, that's how they grow. And another thing that athletes do, and we can see that easily, is teamwork. That's the base of any sports. Even sports, there are single person. Let's say like a, a fighter. He also have a whole team behind him, helping him. There's the trainer. There's the spotters. There is the massage therapist. He has a whole team supporting him. No one is an island. And the same for postmaster. We are a team here. We support each other. It's our job to motivate people to speak more often to take more, more roles, to apply the skills more often, to improve. Because some people might be shy, some people might slowing down, be slowing down. But if you can tap on them and say, hey, can I help you? Can, can, uh, what do you need to do a speech next week? How can I help you? How can I support you? You're going to see that the whole club is going to improve. Because we're not only self-centered and like, how can I do more, but how can I help others do more? It's kind of like we have a baseline of performance. And whenever we go above this baseline, it's like we have a rubber band with us, and that rubber band gets stretched. And as it gets stretched, it creates more tension. And when it's too far away and we're performing too much better than others, to uh, a lot more work, we tend to be dragged down to that baseline. That's the power of peer group. The thing is, you can go and search for other peer groups, but as a leader, you, it's your job as well to drag the baseline up. It's your job to inspire others to do more, to perform more, to do more often, so they also improve. So when you go that, your performance is going to go up. So think about, how can I incentivize my fellow members to take on more, on more roles, to do the prepare speeches more often. How can I do that? And you think as a whole. And another thing which is a little bit controversial to talk about in Toastmasters but also helps a lot is competition. Competition drives humans. We love to watch competition. It doesn't matter what it is, it may be in sports, in music, in anything, in business, we, want, we like competition. We like to compete. Like, I remember one story that I read from Charles Schwab. Do you know Charles Schwab? Mm -hmm. So he went to, he was managing a few steel mills in the US, and he went to the worst performing factory ever. And he got there and he inspected everything. Everything seems, seems to be fine. So he could not understand why was this the worst. So when he was about to leave, he asked one worker in the morning, hey, how many runs of steels did you do today? It was about the end of the shift, so the guy said, oh, we did six. So he picked up a big chalk, and he, did, he drew a huge six on the floor, and he left. So the afternoon shift came and asked, why is this six on the floor? And then they said, the boss came and said, uh, how many runs of steel we did? So by the end of that day, the afternoon shift erased the six and drew a seven. Two weeks later, 
Charles Schwab came back. There was a big 12 on the floor. They doubled the performance in two weeks just because of the competition between the shifts. Who can do more? How can I do more? And that can help a lot in Toastmasters as well. Think about it. How can I, can I perform more? How can I incentivize others to, to speak more often, let's say, or to take on more roles? Get together, find a buddy and say, let's bet. Who can give more speeches this semester? <clears throat> let's get who can complete more projects this semester, both from the communication manual and from the leadership manual. How can I do that? And then when you do that, what's going to happen is almost every week you're going to be trying to speak. Almost every week you're going to get a new role. You're going to go through the manual. Because I don't know about it here, but a lot of clubs, I've been to, to a lot of Toastmasters clubs and I see one thing. Most people take the roles without reading the manual. Most people pick up the leadership role and put it aside. They don't know what is in the manual. Like, there is a specific reason for each and every role. And you can put in your leadership manual. Because there are performance indicators that you're going to have in the manual that's going to improve your leadership skills. So go to the manual. When you take a role, see how does this role fit in the leadership manual? How can I learn from this role? Instead of just being a timer and flipping the, the colors, how can I actually learn? What, what do I learn by doing that? A lot of people are not curious. What do I learn by doing that? But there it is. And I'm going to show you how competition helps us to build up motivation, to build up energy. And let's split this room. Let me show the sides here. Okay? You're, let's say, you're A and you're B. Uh, a, your mission is to put all the chairs in this room close to here. B, all the chairs in this room close to this chair. Okay? Let's create some energy. Let's have some fun. Let's go. Let's <laughs> do wins. All the chairs. 100%, guys. 100%. 100%. something unless you devote top tens of thousands of hours to do something. But you can be you can get to the best if you're improving as a as a ladder. Think about it, the the bell system here. It's kind of like a ladder. You're climbing up until you get to the black belt and then when you get to the black belt you're actually starting your martial arts thing. Then you have the first ten, second and etc. But the thing is what is the next level for you? If you're a white belt, you never give a presentation. The next, the, the next belt would be, how can I do my icebreaker? Then after that is, how can I complete the first manual? How can I complete the second manual? Which manual do I want to follow? 
I think now we Toastmasters is changing the the menu since we're gonna have five tracks now, right? Yeah, like yeah I, I'm not sure yet, but with this the system as it is right now, you have two tracks. And the two tracks are very well defined. What's the next step? And if you follow that, you can get a lot faster and you can improve a lot in a short period of time. You'll be you'll be amazed on how how good you become if you do that. Like, instead of worrying about how am I going to look like, how can I become the next Tony Robbins? You think about how can I do my next level? Let's say, for instance, one thing that, first, that I was very, very frustrated about is about the amount of people I was speaking to. Like, I saw Tony Robbins and I was like, I want to speak to 3,000 people. And I would come and I would speak to 50 people, to 100 people, to 300 people. And I'll be like, I want 3,000. I don't like it. And I'll be pissed off. But the thing is that I did not realize I wasn't prepared for 3,000. I'm still not prepared for 3,000. I'm very excited for 1,000 people that I'm going to be speaking in April. But like, if you think about the big thing, like think about an Olympic, Olympic athlete. An Olympic athlete, like when they started, let's say a swimmer, he did not think like, oh, I'm going to train for the Olympics right now. They had the vision of the Olympics. Like since kids, they think, well, oh, one day I'm going to be Olymp uh, competing in the Olympics. But when they are practicing, they are practicing first for the club level. And they, they win the club level, then they go to the city level. And only when they win, then they train for the state level, for, for the regional level, for the national level, and the Olympics. Like same thing, for instance, with the Toastmasters competition. Like, some people did, like, me included, I was, uh, I was preparing my speech, uh, first time I was like, how can this speech take me to Vegas, to the international competition? And I, I was crafted, etc. And then I went to the competition, and I lost in the club competition. I got frustrated. I didn't want to compete anymore. I'm like, ah, how can? The thing is, if I would be prepared for the club competition, Losing the club competition wouldn't hurt me so much. And the same thing is for you. If you're thinking think about competing in Toastmasters, like, think about how can I win first the club competition. I won the club, then I, I work hard to win the, uh, the area, and then the division, then the district, then go to Vegas and win Vegas. But if you think about the last one, if you happen to lose in the beginning, you lose all your motivation to try again, to improve. Think about the swimmer was said. Think about the timing of a person who haven't won the city level yet. Their timing is a lot longer than an Olympic athlete. And then they train for two years. And they improve their time a lot. But they're still comp uh, comparing themselves to the uh, Olympic athletes. Their time is still years ahead. Like, they're not going to feel motivated. It's like, I worked so hard until now, and I got nowhere close. But if they think about the city competition and they see their timing, they see how her time did, his time or her time improved. And then they feel a lot more motivated because they know they can win. So what is your next level right now? What what, do you, what can you do? And when you do that, you need to keep, uh, pay attention to the metrics. Like think about every athlete know their metrics. Like, what is your key performance indicator right now? At your job? At Toastmasters? Like, do you have a way to evaluate yourself? You get evaluation from others, but do you have a way to evaluate yourself? To know, like, okay, uh, my key performance indicator is going to be how many roles I take. And I want to take that amount of roles. Or how many projects I complete. And I'm going to take this amount of projects. And you have a goal, like, how can I uh, improve something if I don't take metrics and take a very deep look at them and see like, okay, I, I, I was good in this one, I was not good in this one, uh, I can improve this one. How can you know that if you don't keep metrics? So it's very, very important to have a way to keep, keep track of what is important to you, to your development. Like for me, uh, and the business of speaking now. Uh, 
my business, my metrics are how many events did I find, how many leads I generate, how many events I contacted, how many responded back to me, how many got injured, and how many events I booked. There are five key performance indicators. And I know that when I'm contacting 200 events in a month, I'm getting uh, two to four events booking me. If I'm contacting 100 a month, I'm going to have one on two only. But I know that because I have a spreadsheet that I put every day how much uh, events I contact and all that. On the speaking side, it's a little bit different. My key performance indicators would be the quality of the testimonials that I have. The, uh, how many times, if I'm doing a keynote, is how, how many uhs and nahs and bad postures I got. If I'm doing a workshop, is the result of the workshop brought after. So each part, there's a different thing. And I have to fit in what is my key performance indicator in that area and do it. And a great thing for, for you to get a performance indicator is getting a coach, getting a mentor. Like Toastmasters is a mentoring program. Who here, from, who is from Toastmasters? Raise your hand. Keep your hand high. Okay. How many of you mentored someone? Look, half of the people got down. Now, how many of you got mentored? Some people also did not get mentored. So there's a great mentoring system that helps you to go for the first uh, uh, projects. Take advantage of that. Actually, for you to get your, your leadership uh, certification, you've got to mentor three people. So why are you not mentoring? Offer it. If you're starting, ask for a mentor. That's good for both sides. It's part of your leadership uh, track. And it's very, very important to get it. And the last part is motivation. Like, do you know the story of this girl? Does anyone know? She, loves, she, she was a very good surfer. She's the, the daughter of like, a legend in surfing. And she, she was competing and all that when she was a kid. But she only won one competition. And then she got bitten by a shark and lost one arm. And, and she decided to say, you know what, I'm not going to let that stop my career. She, she, she was grown up in the, the surfing uh, lifestyle. So she said, you know what, I'm going to continue competing. And I want to compete with other, other surfers. I don't want to get into a special competition with people with no arms. I want to compete with, with women that have two arms. And I just don't want to compete with men because of different competition. Otherwise, I would. And she had that drive inside of her. And after she got up to today, I guess she already won nine or ten different surfing competitions. She won more competitions after she lost the arm than before. And I'm going to show you why. Can you come here? Does anyone know what it is? This? That's uh, to measure the grip strength. There's a dynamometer. So what you're going to do here is uh, you're going to press as hard as you can with your hands down. As hard as you can. Yeah, let go. How much? Uh, 54. 54 kilos of grip strength. So now you're gonna you're gonna say it a lot. Uh, I'm awesome. I I'm I can do it. I'm awesome. I can do it. And you press as hard as you can. <laughs> you gotta say it. You gotta say it. Let me. Okay. Just press. Okay. I'm awesome. I can do it. Yeah. I'm a hero. I can do it. Yeah. Whoa. A little bit more. A little bit more, okay. 4.9. <laughs> now you're going to say, you know what, I can't do anything right, I'm such a loser. And you're going to press. <laughs> I can't do anything more. Press as hard as you can. Whoa. As hard as you can. I can't do anything more. Whoa. How much? Oh, 44. 44 <laughs> group strength. So he lost, stay here, stay here, stay here. Oh. <laughs> he lost about 10 kilos of group strength because of that. And I'm going to show you how you learned that because I don't want to do the, the, the machine first because the machine is numbered so everybody can see that, that he lost strength when he did that. 
But what I'm gonna teach, I'm gonna do with him now, and you're gonna be able to do with each other later, is what's your strongest arm? What's your strongest arm? Uh, I think this back. Okay. So raise your hand like this. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I'm gonna try to press now, and you gotta create a resistance up. You gotta keep, try to keep the leg here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Don't try to put it up. Just try to keep it. Yeah. Okay. So tell me your name. Uh, Yuri Zhou. Okay. Now your name say John. What's your name? Uh, Yuri Zhou. No. Say, John. <laughs> <laughs> uh, say Patrick. Yeah. Uh, what's your name? Patrick. Uh, yeah. Keep it up. Okay. Say I'm strong. I can do it. I'm strong. I can do it. Now, where is this? Yeah. I'm strong. I can do it. I'm strong. I can do it. Uh, I'm weak. I cannot do anything right. I'm they weak. keep resisting. Yeah. I'm weak. I can do anything else. <laughs> Now, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, keep, resist keep resisting. I'm uh, awake, I can't do anything else. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see the difference? How much easier it was? So try it out with yourself. I'll get it with each other. And ask the first name correct, and then another name created. And then uh, I'm awesome, I can do it. And I'm wrong, I cannot do anything right. Just start testing it out. Get in groups and do that. <laughs>